So good morning, my name is Emily Toomey. Uh, I work with the Quantum Nanostructures and Nanofabrication Group at MIT under Professor Carl Bergren. And this morning I'll be talking about nonlinear thermal interactions in nanowires and how they mimic Josephson behavior. So nonlinear oscillations are found in a wide variety of natural and physical systems. Uh, for instance, cardiac rhythms, neuron firing, and laser diodes with optical feedback all show some type of nonlinear oscillatory behavior. And you can really break down all of these behaviors into two very simple elements. So the first is some type of biostability. So in the example of neuron firing, that would be the state of the ion channel either being open or closed. Now that biostability is fed through uh, some type of feedback cycle. Again, in the case of neuron firing, that would be the membrane potential. So the combination of a biostability and a feedback cycle form an oscillation of that nonlinear behavior that looks like the pulse strain I've shown here in red. Now, superconductors can be considered ideal nonlinear elements, and you can view that in two different ways. Um, the first is through the nonlinearity of the phase dynamics themselves, and what I mean by that is the phase of the superconducting electrons. So, Perhaps the most uh, common superconducting device is the Josephson junction. And I've shown that here, and it's comprised simply of two superconductors uh, sandwiching a thin insulating barrier. Now, as a result, the paired superconducting electrons, or Cooper pairs, can tunnel through that barrier. So in superconductors, the electrons can be described uh, together by a collective wave function. And as you can see here, that wave function is described by a phase. So as a result of that insulating barrier, you end up with a phase difference on either side of that barrier. So shown here as phi L and phi R. And in a Josephson junction, the phase difference between the two defines both the current and the voltage through that device. And I've shown that here with the two constitutive equations. And we call that uh, down here, the current phase relationship of the device. So as you can see, there is a sinusoidal relationship between the current and the phase difference in the Josephson junction. Now, conversely, we can think about this in more of a macroscopic sense. So we can consider a superconductor as a, a bi-stable physical system. So here I've shown the current and the voltage characteristics of a device. And you can see that the superconductor switches between two states, the superconducting state and the resistive state. When you're in the superconducting state, you can run current through the device, shown here, without any voltage forming. However, once you surpass a certain critical parameter, you jump abruptly from the superconducting state into the resistive state and then form a voltage. Now, all of the switching can be manipulated by changes in uh, temperature, magnetic fields, or current density. Uh, these are the three critical parameters you can use to tune a superconductor. So as a result, there are great models for studying how nonlinearity can be modulated by external variables. And perhaps the most common example of that is the AC Josephson effect. Now, that's due to phase locking between the nonlinear current phase relationship of the Josephson junction that I showed previously and an applied external periodic drive. So just to kind of go through that quickly, here I've shown just a basic schematic again of a Josephson junction. And uh, below are its constitutive equations that I also showed previously. And currently I'm just applying a steady DC uh, voltage bias. Now, when I apply an AC drive over that, an AC voltage drive, what ends up happening is that the overall voltage now becomes time dependent. So now it's a combination of both the DC drive and the AC drive. Now, when you go through a little bit of math with those constitutive equations, what you end up seeing is that the supercurrent through the device now is both a function of the DC voltage and the AC voltage. And you can see that that contributes to the two time-dependent terms. Now, as a result, because these terms are of opposite sign, when they're equal, the time dependence of the supercurrent is completely canceled out, and you're left with just a DC supercurrent. Now, how does that manifest itself experimentally? Well, if you're looking at the current voltage characteristics of the device again, what you end up getting is distinct DC current steps in the uh, I versus V. And these steps occur where these two time dependencies are equal, or at intervals of HF over 2E, where F is a frequency of the applied radiation. 
Now, just to give some numbers, that equates to roughly 4.83 gigahertz for 10 microvolts. So these are extremely fast oscillations that can happen. Now, this has been known for a long time. It was first uh, demonstrated experimentally by Shapiro et al. in 1964. And it's subsequently been used in uh, much literature since then as really a way of identifying Josephson behavior in a device and identifying that it has that sinusoidal current phase relationship. Um, furthermore, it's facilitated numerous types of technologies. For instance, the Josephson voltage standard um, basically uses this effect to uh, apply a DC voltage to the device. You observe which frequency it oscillates at. You can use that relationship backwards and then really determine what that true voltage you were applying was. Now, nanowires, on the other hand, have a different type of nonlinearity. And it's more of the second type that I was mentioning, that uh, bistable physical state. And the reason for that is because they largely act thermally. So here I'm just going to walk through the basic thermal transitions in a nanowire. So, uh, first, I've shown the nanowire in the superconducting state, and so we're down here on the graph. So we're applying a current to the device, and there's no voltage forming because it's still superconducting. Now what happens is, if we increase the bias current past what's called the critical current of the device, you end up jumping sharply from the superconducting state into that resistive state, and now a voltage is formed. And in the device itself, you end up with what's called a joule-heated hotspot, so a lot of uh, thermal interactions going on in the device. And that hotspot's on the order of 1 to 10 kilo ohms, usually. Now, if I want to go back to the superconducting state, I can reduce the bias current. So now I'm going down the slope on the current voltage characteristics. But because you have this heated hotspot, you have to reduce the bias current uh, considerably for that hotspot to collapse and cool down. So as a result, you end up with a, what's called a retrapping current that's at a much lower bias current than the one that you initially switched at. And we call that hysteresis. So the difference between that switching current and the retrapping current are trademarks of joule heating in the device. And so as a result, we can see that this uh, retrapping or this biostable switching is really limited in time by that uh, hotspot relaxation process. So as a result, these are much slower than the tens of gigahertz oscillations that you normally see in a Josephson junction. So despite these oscillations being slower and uh, nanowires being slower devices, um, they've facilitated numerous types of nonlinear technologies. And I won't go through them in detail, but uh, for instance, they have use in photon sensing as uh, superconducting nanowire single photon detectors, or SNSPDs. They've also found use as digital comparators and uh, in logic readout. And all of these devices rely on that hotspot formation process to either indicate uh, a detection event or to have some type of uh, logic operation. So given that nanowires lack the sinusoidal current phase relationship of a Josephson junction, they have their own form of thermal nonlinearity. The question is, can they still have nonlinear oscillations? Now, if you look uh, in research, you've seen that indeed they can. It's been shown in those superconducting nanowire single photon detectors, or SNSPDs. And those were seen to have these electrothermal oscillations uh, due to electrothermal feedback with the 50 ohm impedance of a readout circuit. So I've shown that briefly here. You have the 1 to 10 kilo ohms of impedance of the actual detector, and that oscillates in line with the 50 ohm impedance of the readout circuit. Now, the maximum oscillation frequency of these systems was limited to uh, less than 200 megahertz, which is quite slow in comparison to what you obtain with the Josephson junction. And the reason for that is that these devices have considerable inductance, uh, in this case on the order of 200 to 500 nanohenries. So what we wanted to know is if we could observe faster oscillations in nanowires and push the speed at which these types of uh, relaxation and switching happen. And if we push the limit of these oscillations, are they still thermal, or do they end up acting more coherently like an Josephson injunction? Now, before I go into our approach, I just want to mention briefly why these nanowires are so slow. And the reason for that is that in nanowire devices, or in superconducting nanowire devices, what happens is that the, uh, most of the inductance is from the energy that's stored as kinetic energy of the superconducting electrons. And as a result, we refer to this as the kinetic inductance of the device. It's typically defined as an inductance per square. So for example, here I've shown a typical SNSPD meander geometry. 
and you can physically break down that geometry into squares. So the longer your nanowire taper is, or the longer your meander is, the more squares of material you have and the higher inductance you have. So as a result, you have a total inductance that's proportional to the length of your geometry. So in these detectors, you want to have a very large active area. So consequently, the meander is quite considerable. And that's why you have such a high inductance in your device. So in our case, we wanted to create fast oscillations. And we did this through uh, two different approaches. So the first we wanted to do is reduce the kinetic inductance in comparison to a typical SNSPD. And the second was to introduce local shunting. And what I mean by that is introducing an impedance that's more local than the 50 ohm impedance of a typical readout circuit. So first, in order to obtain a very low inductance device, we got rid of that meander geometry and instead had a very uh, simple geometry that tapered into a nanowire with a minimum width of 60 nanometers. Additionally, we did this through a very thick film of niobium nitride, so that's our superconducting material. Now, typically, the thin films that we use are on the order of five nanometers. Here, however, we used a film about 40 nanometers thick, and that was done in order to reduce the overall inductance per square of our device. So here I've shown um, just the scanning electron micrograph of our device, and again, the inset just shows that 60 nanometer taper. And then quickly, just to go through the nanofabrication process, uh, it was all done through electron beam lithography. So first, we deposited the film on top of just a silicon substrate. Afterwards, we uh, spun electron beam resist and exposed in the 125 kV EBL system here. Afterwards, we developed that pattern uh, in TMAH. And then finally, we completed the pattern transfer to the underlying superconducting substrate using a reactive ion etch in CF4. So once we had our device, we just built a very basic circuit model for what our setup was. So here in the red outline box, I've shown the circuit equivalent of a nanowire. So we have that hotspot impedance, uh, and that's in parallel with a switch. Now that switch is closed, providing a short to ground when it's in the superconducting state, and it's open, providing the pathway to the hotspot resistance when it's now in the resistive state. Now both of those are in series with the kinetic inductance of the device. So I mentioned previously that we wanted to introduce local shunting. And we did that simply by placing an external resistor very close to the device on the PCB. And we made electrical connections via wire bonds. Now, in our case, this was actually important to consider because we had reduced the kinetic inductance of the device so much that it was below 5 nanohenries. And for a wire bond, the typical rule of thumb is about 1 nanohenry per millimeter. So as a result, our wire bonds contributed significantly to the overall inductance of our setup. So it had to be included in the circuit model. So the first thing we wanted to do was to look at the actual oscillations. So to look at the high frequency RF output of our device. And that was done simply by dunking it in liquid helium at 4.2 Kelvin and then amplifying the RF output of a bias D. So here's what we observed uh, experimentally. So in this case, the experimental data is shown in blue. And this is when we shunted the device with 10 ohms. And we biased it right above its critical current at around 37 microamps. And two things stand out first. So we can see that the actual period of the experimental oscillation is quite slow. It's around uh, 4.2 to 4.6 nanoseconds, which is much slower than what you obtain in a Josephson junction oscillation. So this was the first indication to us that these oscillations were still thermal. And indeed, what we've shown here in red is comparison to electrothermal simulations done in LT space. And by looking at the agreement between the two, it's a good indication to us that there is still some thermal mechanism at play in our devices and nothing coherent like a Joseph's injunction. And the shape of this waveform can really be understood by breaking it down again into a biostability and feedback cycle. So first, uh, we have the superconducting nanowire here. And the current is all going through the nanowire because it's providing a path to ground. However, once we surpass that critical current, a hotspot forms. And so as a result, the current is now diverted to the shunt resistor. That allows the bias current through the nanowire to be reduced, such that the hotspot collapses. And then the bias current can be diverted back through the nanowire, and the process repeats itself. So as a result, you end up with the voltage versus time output pulse train that looks like the one I've shown here. So with that understanding in mind, we can really break down that oscillation into two basic time domains. 
So the first, that very sharp rising edge, represents the time it takes to divert the bias current to the shunt resistor once the nanowire has switched. And it's much shorter because that L over R time constant is dependent on both the shunt resistance as well as the hotspot resistance. Conversely, that much slower decay represents the time it takes to divert the bias current back through the superconducting nanowire. And this is much slower now because the L over R time constant is solely dependent on the shunt resistance since the hotspot resistance isn't seen. So with these two time domains, we can put together a, an approximate estimation for what the overall oscillation frequency should be. So here I've shown what the uh, period of the oscillation should be based on these two times. And so the equation's shown, but the important thing to take away isn't so much the equation, but rather noting that the oscillation frequency is a function of the shunt resistance, the series inductance, and the bias current. So as a result, we have three tuning parameters that we can use to maximize the oscillation frequency of our device. So in our case, we fixed the shunt resistance and wanted to manipulate both the series inductance and the bias current. So here's what we obtained experimentally. So here I've shown the bias current on the x-axis and oscillation frequency on the y-axis. And what you can see is that as you increase the bias current, that oscillation frequency also increases. Now, the red curve represents a higher inductance, and the black represents a lower inductance. And we did that simply by changing the distance between the shunt resistor and the nanowire, and therefore changing the wire bond length. And as you can see, changing the inductance plays a considerable role in the overall frequency of the device. So again, that validated our uh, previous model. And then finally, for each of the high inductance and the low inductance experimental uh, data sets, we compared it both to the simple model I presented on the previous slide, as well as to simulations done in SPICE. And you can see that there's good agreement between all three of them. So as a result, we have agreement between the experimental, the simple model, and the electrothermal simulations, which really validates for us that hotspot relaxation is the underlying mechanism behind this oscillation. And then finally, and perhaps the most important thing, in our low inductance case, we obtained a maximum oscillation frequency of a little over 850 megahertz, which is more than four times what was previously obtained in literature through these systems. So we see that these oscillations can be much faster than what was previously thought. So given how fast these oscillations were, we wanted to know how they manifest themselves in the slow time average DC measurements that you typically use for device characterization. So here I've shown the nanowire both with, when it's unshunted and when it's shunted with 10 ohms. So first, in the unshunted case, you can see that there's a large difference between the switching and the retrapping current, like the nanowire I first showed in this presentation. And this degree of hysteresis indicates that there's substantial joule heating going on in this device. There's a hotspot formation happening. Now, conversely, when we look at the shunted DC characterization, you can see that there's uh, absolutely no hysteresis, and instead, the switching current and the retrapping current are approximately equal. Now, this, at first glance, would seem to indicate that there's no hotspot formation happening. However, we've seen in the RF characteristics that this mechanism has to be induced by some type of electrothermal feedback. So as a result, we can see that because these hotspot oscillations are so fast, they end up kind of being hidden in the actual DC characterization of the device and instead create this rounded switching in the IV curve that looks like stability points. And this actually looks quite similar to what you obtain in a Joseph's injunction when it's heavily damped with a resistor. And indeed, we can make a fit to that basic model shown here in red, and you can see that the agreement is pretty good. Now, this has been used in prior work to argue that shunted nanowires can therefore be treated as heavily damped Joseph's injunctions. Furthermore, when we look at the actual switching statistics of the device, you can see that shunting the device leads to both an increase in the mean switching current as well as a narrowing of that switching distribution. And both of these would seem to indicate that shunting the device makes it less susceptible to random thermal fluctuations that cause it to switch prematurely. And again, this type of change has been used previously to argue that shunted nanowires can act as Joseph's injunctions. So, we seem to be a bit of a crossroads in terms of whether our device is acting thermally or like a Joseph's injunction. So to really get to the heart of the matter, we wanted to look at what I mentioned previously is probably the most quintessential trademark of Joseph's injunctions. And that's the AC Josephson effect, also known as the Shapiro effect for the first experimental observation. <laughs> 
So we did this simply by applying external radiation to our device by an antenna that was soldered onto our PCB and just looking at the DC characteristics as we applied external microwaves. And here's what we obtained experimentally. In this case, our radiation was about 180 megahertz. And I've shown it for two different powers. So as you can see, when you increase the power, distinct steps appear in the current voltage characteristics. And I've just labeled the first four. And you can trace out the amplitudes of these steps as a function of the applied RF power, as I've shown here on the right. And what you can see is that they follow some type of Bessel-like relationship. And indeed, if you make uh, the fit to the Bessel relationship that's typically used for a Joseph's injunction, you can see that the agreement is pretty good. So is this evidence of Joseph's in behavior? Well, first, the steps only appear upon microwave radiation. The step amplitudes fit the typical Bessel relationship that's used in a Joseph's injunction. However, the steps occur at voltage intervals more than 200 times the expected voltage for a Joseph's injunction. So as a result, we have to conclude that this is not Joseph's in behavior. It doesn't follow the same result that you obtain with that sinusoidal current phase relationship. And that would be also in agreement with our RF observations, which clearly noted that some type of thermal hotspot interaction was at play. So it wasn't too surprising that this is an evidence of Joseph's in behavior. But if we go back to what we uh, first know about the AC Joseph's in effect, it's due to a phase locking between that nonlinear current phase relationship and an external drive. In our case, we have a different type of nonlinear oscillation. So what we wanted to know is, is there another means of phase locking to our own form of nonlinear oscillation and to the external drive that we're applying? So to understand this, we went back to looking at the RF characteristics of our device. But this time, we did this while applying uh, external microwaves. So we wanted to look at both the oscillation frequency as a function of the applied RF, so looking at that um, oscillation output, and then also calculating the Fourier spectrum of that uh, voltage output. And here is what we first saw uh, when we biased the device such that its oscillation frequency was roughly 500 megahertz, and the drive frequency was about 320 megahertz. So as you can see on the Fourier spectrum here, both of those peaks are distinctly visible. However, we also interestingly see peaks corresponding to mixing products observed between these two frequencies. So as a result, we can see that there's some type of interaction happening between our relaxation oscillation frequencies and the external frequencies that we're applying. Now, zooming in on the oscillation frequency and the drive frequency, what we can see is that as we gradually increase the power of the drive, that relaxation oscillation frequency gets pulled towards the drive frequency. So not only is there interaction happening between these two frequencies, but the drive is actually influencing the frequency at which our nanowire oscillates. And this was observed both when the drive was less than the oscillation frequency and when the drive was greater than the oscillation frequency. So we could manipulate this effect in either direction. And this type of pulling and mixing has also been observed as a means of phase locking in an inductively shunted Joseph's injunction. So that was some indication to us that pulling and mixing could eventually lead to phase locked behavior. And to understand why this is true, we just built a very simple sawtooth model for modeling our oscillations under the influence of microwaves. So here I've shown the voltage versus time output that we obtained experimentally. And I've converted it to just a very simple current versus time model. And what I mean by that is just current going through the nanowire. So I've approximated that long decay as being dominant in the relationship. So that really uh, dominates the overall time of our uh, oscillation. So here I've shown the current just uh, linearly increasing through the device until it reaches the critical current, at which point it switches as the current is diverted back to the shunt resistor. It goes down, and then the process repeats itself. So what happens when we apply RF? Well, we modeled this simply by changing the switching point of the nanowire uh, with some type of sinusoidal modulation. And you can think about this as you're modulating the switching point of the nanowire from the perspective of the biasing circuit. So for instance, let's say the nanowire has a critical current of 10 microamps, and you're biasing it at 8 microamps. Well, if you come in with an RF uh, modulation that has an amplitude at that point of 2 microamps, your overall device will switch. So from the perspective of the biasing circuit, it will look like it's switching early. But its true critical current hasn't changed. 
So we can estimate this simply by changing that switching point as the critical current plus some type of modulation. And so here's what we obtain in our simulation, uh, again, when the oscillation frequency is 500 megahertz and the drive is about 320. So on the left-hand side, I showed a weaker drive, and you can see that there's some type of slight modulation of that switching point. And below, I've shown just the uh, Fourier spectrum of the device. Now, if you look from the shift of the blue to the red, which indicates the change going from when the nanowire is unmodulated to when the nanowire is now modulated, you can see that that oscillation frequency is shifted slightly towards the drive frequency. Furthermore, you can also see the appearance of one of the mixing products. Now, when I increase the drive frequency even further, you can see that the uh, type of modulation in the time domain is much stronger. And additionally, if you look at the Fourier spectrum, you can see that that pulling is much more significant and that mixing products increase in amplitude and also in number. And when we compare this to our experimental data, our experimental frequency spectrum, you can see that there's good agreement between all of the peaks that are present. Now, finally, to illustrate how this leads to eventual locking between the two frequencies, I've shown an example at higher, a higher frequency drive. So in this case, the oscillation frequency is still at 500 megahertz, but the drive is now at 725 megahertz. So on the left-hand side, again, I've shown the drive when it's a bit weaker, and you can see that there's still some significant modulation happening of the switching point of the device. And when you look at the uh, frequency spectrum, you can see that that uh, oscillation frequency is pulled much more substantially to the drive, and you can also see that there's several mixing products that are apparent. Now, finally, when I increase the drive even further, you can see in the time domain that that modulation is complete. And indeed, when you look at the frequency spectrum of the device, the mixing products have completely vanished, and instead you're left with a single peak, indicating that the relaxation oscillation frequency is now completely locked to the drive. So as a result, we can see that mixing and pulling between these two frequencies can eventually produce phase-locked behavior when that drive frequency is strong enough. So finally, how can this be applied in future nanowire-based devices? Uh, well, just two applications. The first is some type of parametric amplification. So in this case, you could have the nanowire acting as a type of pump, and you send in some type of signal frequency. And that signal frequency can be amplified, and you also obtain a mixing product as a result. And indeed, this has been explored in the same types of oscillations I mentioned previously in the inductively shunted Joseph's injunctions. However, you can also think of the nanowire being used for some type of frequency modulation, where it acts as a carrier, and information about some type of signal you're sending in is carried as mixing products, as sidebands on that uh, frequency. So finally, what have we learned throughout all of this? Well, first, we learned that the hotspot relax relaxations are capable of generating quite rapid oscillations uh, greater than 800 megahertz, which, again, is more than four times what was previously reported in literature, and that although thermal, these oscillations produce similar non-hysteretic DC characteristics as what you obtain in an overdamped Joseph's injunction. And that by looking at the microwave modulation of the device, you end up with characteristics that are deceptively similar to the AC Joseph's in effect. However, the frequency spectrum reveals that mixing and pulling of the relaxation oscillation frequencies to the external drive produce phase locking that produces this effect. So there's actually no type of Joseph's in dynamic at play. And then finally, a question that's still outstanding to us is whether you can eventually obtain non-thermal coherent operation in nanowires, similar to what you obtain in Joseph's injunctions. And if shunting is the method to obtain that, what we've learned in this exercise is that it requires a much more efficient shunting method with a reduced inductance so that the diversion of bias current from the nanowire to the shunt is much more effective in suppressing any type of hotspot formation at all. So thank you so much for your time, and I'd like to acknowledge everyone who helped me in this process. Thank you.